Hi everyone, you're all very welcome to today's parent information talk on returning to a good routine after lockdown, getting the basics right. And this talk is presented by the Mayo Primary Care Child and Adolescent Psychology Service and it's a talk aimed at parents of children and teenagers of all ages. I'll just briefly draw your attention to the description of this talk. Um, you'll see that there's a breakdown of the topics with a timestamp beside it. So if not all topics are relevant to you, you're welcome to fast forward to the topic that suits you. So first, firstly, here's an overview of what we're going to be taking a look at during this talk. So we're going to look at the importance of sleep for children and teens, reducing the use of electronics, how to support a child with anxiety, supporting your child and regulating their emotions. We're going to look at school worries and then maintaining and improving relationships. And at the end, we'll look at the main take home messages. So this talk is basically going to focus on some tips to returning to normal or to returning to routine as the kids are going back to school. And we're going to look at the highlights of each of these topics. If you are interested in any one of these topics, we will be uploading a series of parent information talks. So we will have a talk on the topic of anxiety, the topic of emotional regulation, the importance of attachment, building resilience and the importance of sleep. So there will be for further resources for you to take a look at if you're interested in any of those topics. So firstly, we're going to have a look at the importance of sleep for children and teens. And it's it, the particular focus will be on getting back to a bedtime routine. And as I mentioned, if you are interested in the topic of sleep, we will be uploading a full one hour parent information talk on this topic. So the importance of sleep. Sleep is as important as nutrition and exercise for children. When children meet the adequate number of sleep hours for their age on a regular basis, they're likely to see benefits including better behaviour, better attention span, better learning, better memory, better emotional regulation and overall a better quality of life and the research supports this so sleep is as important as nutrition and exercise and as you'll see from that list there sleep pretty much affects every aspect of our lives and sleep patterns have probably been a little bit disrupted during the lockdown and, and when the children were off school and perhaps they were spending more time on electronics so firstly it's it's very important to get back into a good sleep routine and we'll look at ways that you can do that so firstly, we need to know what is the right amount of sleep for our children and teenagers. This chart is taken from the American Sleep Foundation and you'll see there it has a breakdown of the recommended sleep hours through the ages. So toddlers need 11 to 14 hours of sleep. Preschoolers, which are the three to five year olds, need 10 to 13 hours. School age children, which are six to 13 year olds, need nine to 11 hours of sleep. And then teenagers, which are the 14 to 17 and 18 year olds, need eight to 10 hours of sleep. So you'll see from that that a sleep in or a lie in for teenagers is often quite necessary. And the reason they need these sleep hours is to consolidate the information they've learned throughout the day. So even if they're studying for hours during the day, but they only get six hours of sleep at night time, the information they've studied may not stick. And just out of interest here, the recommended sleep for adults is seven to nine hours per night. So what can we do to help our children get to sleep, stay asleep and have a good quality sleep? These are some things that you can do. So before bedtime, we can focus on exercise, diet and the environment. At bedtime, we're going to look at sleep hygiene and routines. And then during bedtime, we're going to look at nightmares and worries. And screens will also fall into this category. But as I mentioned, we'll focus on that separately as it's a topic unto itself. So exercise first and foremost, as little as 10 minutes of aerobic exercise a day, such as walking or cycling, can drastically improve nighttime sleep quality. Physically, physical activity may help tire very active children naturally. So encouraging your child to exercise in the hours before bedtime, but not too close to bedtime is important there. So the timing of the exercise is is important to note so not to do too much exercise too close to bed because it will actually release the endorphins and wake your children up and gentle stretches is a nice simple way to get in your exercise time 
So as I mentioned, with exercise, it is important to get the timing right. And it does seem pretty self-explanatory that exercise will tire out children and make them more ready to go to bed. But actually exercising too close to bedtime may make it more difficult for your child to fall asleep. So exercising earlier in the day is recommended. And any exercise or vigorous activity raises our internal body temperature and it makes us more alert. So even just be mindful of rough and tumble play between siblings close to bed. That is going to liven them up and make it harder for them to fall asleep. So the last one there, gentle stretches right before bedtime can be really useful for particularly energetic children. It can release the tension in their body to allow for a greater sense of calm when they go to bed. So that's really, really useful, particularly if your children are naturally energetic and also getting into a habit of settling down at the end of the day can go a long way to towards creating a natural rhythm for falling asleep. So it helps create a relaxing ritual as part of bedtime. Try to avoid food that can be disruptive right before sleep. So heavier rich foods, fatty or fried meals, spicy dishes and carbonated drinks can trigger indigestion for some children. Foods high in sugar can spike blood sugar and energy levels and also cut back on caffeinated drinks. So caffeine is a stimulant, as we all know, and its effects on the body last for many hours. And there are lots of hidden sources of caffeine. So tea also contains quite a bit of caffeine um, and any energy drinks and cola drinks, they contain caffeine as well. So just to be mindful of reducing your children or your teens, if they enjoy drinking coffee or tea or cola drinks or fizzy drinks, just to, to be mindful to reduce their intake of those drinks closer to bedtime. And chocolate is another source of caffeine as well, particularly dark chocolate and certain painkillers also contain caffeine. So to be mindful of that. Um, And it's basically just saying here that heavy foods stimulate the child's digestive system, which, of course, keeps the body awake. Something else to consider when we're trying to enhance sleep is the bedroom environment. So ideally, we want to create a soothing sleep environment for our children. So it should be dark and quiet and keep an eye on the room temperature as well and make sure our children have breathable, comfortable pajamas. Declutter the room is also very important. So there's less stimulation for our kids that will keep them up at night and less distraction and fewer things that can be misinterpreted as scary if a child wakes up during the night. So, for instance, if a child wakes up and there's a chair in their room that has loads a pile of clothes on it, that could be interpreted as quite scary in the dark. So just to declutter the room when they're going to bed. Pick colours, artwork, blankets, etc. that are soothing and you can get your child involved in, the, involved in this. So the idea is we want them to be comfortable and feel safe in the bedroom environment. And there is some evidence that certain smells may have an effect on sleep. So lavender can be quite soothing um, when you're trying to get to sleep. And when we get to the anxiety section of this talk, we're going to go through some relaxation techniques that may be useful to try uh, in the bedroom at night time when you're trying to help your child get to sleep. Sleep-wake cycles are an important part of helping us get to sleep at night, so it's important to be mindful of this. So one of the best ways to train the body to sleep well is to go to bed and get up at more or less the same time every day, even on the weekends and days off. So the research suggests that we should keep wake-up times on school days and weekends to within two hours of each other because this helps our body clock get into a regular rhythm. So if your child gets up at half seven to go to school, then on the weekends they should be getting up by half nine. So just to try and be mindful of that two hour window. So this regular rhythm or routine will make you feel better and it will give your body something to work from. And also something to note here is to, to aim to keep daytime routine the same. So even if you have a bad night's sleep or your child has a bad night's sleep and they're tired, it's important that you try to keep their daytime activities the same as you have planned. So that is just don't avoid activities because you feel tired. So if your child is tired and he's saying he doesn't want to go to football practice after school, it's important to try and make sure that he does to keep that daytime routine because if you start to to change your routine because you're tired it can reinforce poor sleep so the importance of a bedtime routine then a bedtime routine means doing the same things every night in preparation of winding down and going to sleep children with a regular nighttime routine have earlier bedtimes fall asleep quicker wake less during the night and sleep for longer and they tend to have fewer behavioral problems during the day 
So consistent or predictable bedtime routines help to prepare the body and the mind for sleep and they help children understand and learn what comes next. So a routine is generally comforting and useful for everybody, even children, teenagers, adults. We all find routine comforting and especially at bedtime. And again, the research shows that families with good bedtime routines benefit from all these advantages so the children fall asleep quicker they have less behavioral problems and they sleep for better and have better quality sleep as well so as i mentioned before try to keep the wake-up times on the school days and weekends to within two hours of each other and keep the daytime routine the same even if you are tired so just to create that bedtime routine and pattern so then how do we set up a bedtime routine Firstly, we need to set a bedtime. So you need to decide on a suitable bedtime, ensuring your child is getting the optimal amount of sleep for their age. And you can refer back to the slide I showed you earlier from the American Sleep Foundation, which had the breakdown of recommended sleep hours um, our children should be getting at their age. So have a look at that slide and decide on a suitable bedtime for your child. Then it's important to inform your child of the bedtime. You need to give a warning as bedtime approaches, be consistent in enforcing the bedtime and let your children know that a late bedtime is a special privilege and an exception. So when you're informing your child of the bedtime, if your child can't tell the time yet, you can draw a picture of a clock with their bedtime on it and place it near a real clock so that they can compare that. So draw a picture, let's say if, your be- if their bedtime is 7 p.m., draw a picture of 7 p.m. on a clock, put it beside a real clock, and when the picture of the clock looks like the real clock, that's bedtime. And then older children can be given a clock in their room or a watch to remind them when they have to go to bed. And it's important there when you're setting the bedtime to make sure that resistance is not due to the child being put to bed too early. And it's okay to establish a later, more suitable bedtime if needs be. And again, you can refer back to the chart that we looked at earlier. It is important to give a warning as bedtime approaches. So saying things like in 10 minutes when the alarm goes off, it will be time to go to bed or after this story is finished, it will be time to go to bed. Telling our children suddenly go to bed now only invites resistance. So it is helpful to give them a warning. And of course, there will be occasions where it won't be suitable to enforce the bedtime. So if there's a special program on TV or if there's family paying a visit to the house but you have to make sure that your child knows that staying up late is a special privilege and it's an exception to the rule. Another aspect of setting up a bedtime routine is establishing a winding down routine. So this can start about an hour before bedtime and ideally screens will be turned off at this point where possible. This needs to be consistent and ritualistic. So do the same calm, quiet activities such as a warm bath, stories or listening to music every night in the hour coming up to bedtime. And avoid rough play, as I mentioned earlier, and scary TV programs and food or drinks that contain caffeine prior to this bedtime. So during the wind down routine, avoid those food and, and drinks that we spoke about earlier. So you should try to make sure that the routine is always in a predictable order because bedtime rituals are reassuring and soothing for children and they reduce resistance to falling asleep and they calm separation fears as well in in younger children. So then how do we manage protests at bedtime? Because there will often be protests at bedtime, as we all know. So most importantly, you need to try to remain calm and clear and make it clear that this is bedtime and nothing is going to change that. Acknowledge that sometimes it's hard to go to bed and that it's also very important for us all to get proper sleep. Try not to respond to protests and tears and remain calm and clear and follow through with the routine. So even if your child is getting upset or getting worked up or crying, it's important to try to carry on with the winding down routine, even through the protest. So continue reading the stories, continue having the warm bath, continue playing the jigsaw, doing the colouring, whatever you're doing in the wind down routine. Continue doing that, even though you may be um, you may be getting some protests from your child. And of course, it's very hard it's the end of the day and everyone is tired but it will make it easier for you in the long run if you're consistent with the bedtime routine so then how do we cope with our children having nightmares 
you can start with soothing words. So I'm sorry that you're scared or you can give them a hug and then return your child to his or her bed. So the important thing is to comfort your child from his own bed. Next, refocus your child away from the memory of the nightmare and onto something else. If you do this soon, your child will forget what the nightmare was about. So you might say things like, look at your face, it's all sweaty. Will we go into the bathroom and clean you up? Or you look really upset, let's think about something nice. How about we plan what we should do tomorrow or what we'll do at the weekend? Or why don't we try some calm breathing or relaxation to get you ready to go to sleep? And later on in this talk, we'll go through some relaxation techniques that you can employ with your child if they are experiencing nightmares. You can then recommend some coping tools to demonstrate to your child that he or she has the ability to actively feel better. And again, this can be relaxation techniques if it's something that your child enjoys. So reassure your child. They may fear that you will leave. So if your child is a nightmare and comes into your bedroom in the night, reassure them, bring them back to their own room and then reassure them that you're not going anywhere. Reassure them that you'll always be there. And if you are planning on going out after ch after the child has gone to sleep, be sure to let them know. Tell them in advance and let them know that you'll be there in the morning. So being understanding is important when we're dealing with nightmares as well. So go to their room and cuddle them, but just don't bring them back into your bed. Turn on the light and show them how familiar everything is in their bedroom. And don't say things like that nightmare is silly or stupid because they do seem very real to children when they're having them. And you can encourage them if they are having nightmares, encourage them to come up with a good ending for a bad dream where they courageously overcome the fearful thing. And or tell them something that may make them feel better. So remind them of a fun holiday that you had in the past or remind them that you're going swimming at the weekend and how much fun you're going to have. And let them know that part of growing up is learning to handle and control their fears and nightmares and being able to get through the night without help from you. So then nighttime worries are another aspect that can affect children's sleep. So helping with bedtime fears during the day, we're going to focus on correcting misinformation. And this is particularly relevant at the moment due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. It's important to monitor what our children are seeing and hearing on the news every day. So misinformation from television has been found to feed a, a high proportion of nighttime fears in children. One study reported that 89% of children attribute their fears to negative information they've picked up along the way. If they see something on television and they're worried about it happening to them, point out how their circumstances are different to what they're hearing or seeing on the television. Finding the differences will help to loosen the association between what they've seen and their own circumstances. And we will focus more on this in the anxiety section as well. And just to, to point out that we are uploading a full one hour parent information talk on anxiety in children and supporting our children with their anxiety. So if you're interested in that, I would I would urge you to take a look at that talk also. So worry time is another thing that you can do to help with bedtime fears during the day. So if your child is worried about something, set aside a time to talk to your child about their worries. This may help your child understand and name what it is that they're feeling. If your child still feels anxious at bedtime, suggest writing the worry down and leaving it in a worry jar to discuss the next day. This allows the child to get the worry out of their minds and onto paper. So if your child is particularly worried throughout the day, you can set aside 15 minutes every day to have worry time. So if your child is coming to you during the daytime saying, I'm worried about this, I'm worried about that, you can say to them, OK, we'll sit down during worry time and we'll discuss those worries. And you have your 15 minutes dedicated to that. And if you can't get through all the worries in that 15 minutes, you can tell your child, why don't you write that worry down and we'll pop it in the worry jar and then we can discuss it tomorrow. And it helps our children to realize that just because they've stopped worrying and they've put it down on paper and they're not worrying about it, nothing bad is going to happen. And that worry will be addressed tomorrow during worry time. So it just li limits the, the amount of time that your child is feeling worried. So the next topic we're going to take a look at is the use of screens and electronics. So there was probably an increase in screen usage and electronic usage during the lockdown. So we're going to take a look at how we can reduce that and also the impact that screens have on our sleep. So now we're going to take a look at the impact of screens on sleep. 
The use of technology at night time can interfere with both the amount of sleep we get and the quality of sleep. So typically when we're on screens at night time, we're getting less sleep and we're getting poorer quality sleep. Viewing bright screens at night can significantly impact the time children, teenagers and us start to feel sleepy and eventually fall asleep as viewing screens increases alertness and it inhibits the release of melatonin. So what is melatonin? It's the hormone that controls the sleep-wake cycle or circadian rhythm and reducing melatonin makes it harder to fall and stay asleep. So we need melatonin in order to fall asleep and the blue screens that we, we see when we're looking at our screens inhibits the release of melatonin. And what can we do about screen usage then? It's a good idea to implement a no screen time for at least an hour before bed. So this can be implemented into the wind down, wind down routine where there's no screen time during the wind down routine. And aim not to have screens in bedrooms. So studies have shown that young people with screens in their bedroom get up to an hour's less sleep per night than children and teens that don't have screens in their bedroom. A good idea as well is to charge devices in a separate room. And when we talk about screens here, we're talking about phones, tablets, computers, televisions, anything like that. So it is a really good idea to charge any devices that your children or teens have in a separate room. And with younger children, it's a good idea to start as you mean to go on with this. And you can adopt a family wide rule or ban. So no phones in the bedrooms or no phones at dinner at the dinner table. And if screens are already an issue for your family, you can aim to cut it down gradually. So try to replace screen time with another nice activity. So instead of playing on your screens or on your phones or tablets that hour before bedtime, you can say, why don't we all play together? Why don't we do a jigsaw? Why don't we read a book together for younger children? Now, this is a tough one for teenagers, especially those already going to bed with their phones. But you may think they're asleep, but they're really on their phones or their tablets when they're in that bedroom and they're getting less sleep. So take the time to strategize with your teenager on how to set limits. It will be very worth your time and the resistance in the long run. And a good tip here is to be a good role model by limiting your own screen time and establish clear rules. So set time when electronics need to be turned off and allow your teen to give input about the screen time rules. That's really important to get buy in from your teen and you can address any problems and problem solve together and make it clear that you want everyone in the family to develop a healthy relationship with electronics. Encouraging appropriate screen use and we'll look at some tips on how we can do that now. So firstly, you can create screen free zones. Establish zones in your home where electronics such as phones and laptops are not allowed. So for example, you could say the kitchen is reserved for meals and family conversation. So it's a screen free zone. You can set aside times to unplug. It might be useful to establish times for the entire family to unplug from technology. So, for example, you could say the dinner hour is a time where we're not going to use electronics or an hour before children's bedtime when you're doing the wind down routine. That can be a nice time for the family to have quality time together without using screens. You can make screen time a privilege. So screen time can be viewed as a treat rather than an automatic activity for children and educate yourself. So today's kids are tech savvy with many knowing more about electronics than their parents. It can be useful to stay up to date on the latest app or social media trend to help guide your child. It is challenging to teach your child about appropriate use of social media unless you understand how it works. It can be a tricky thing to do to keep up to date with all the latest apps and social media, but it's, it's worthwhile. So we'll take a look at some more tips on encouraging appropriate screen use now. So talk to your children about the impact of screen time. Children are less likely to try to break the rules if they understand why they're being implemented. So children who understand it's not healthy to watch too much TV may be less likely to try and break the rules compared to children who think I can't watch TV because my parents are mean. So in an age appropriate manner, the family can discuss the impact of video games, apps, social media and discuss, for example, the impact on attention, the dangers of online predators, the effect it has on sleep. And you can establish how you as a family can work together to reduce the potential risks. Know your child's passwords and know what social media they're using. Depending on your child's age, it may be useful to know their passwords. 
And again, it does depend on your child's age and your values. This wouldn't be recommended for teenagers. It's more so for younger children that it may be useful to know their passwords to their online accounts and have an agreement about social media and what services you'll allow them to use. Many children do need support to address difficulties which can arise online, such as cyberbullying, and parents' awareness of an issue can help support discussion. Encourage other activities so some children can quickly develop habits around using technology for entertainment. Encouraging other activities that do not involve screens can be supportive. Some families find it useful to keep a chart of other activities that are available, such as art projects, reading, family jigsaws, family activities. You can keep that chart on display that your children can go and take a look at to decide on another activity to do rather than spend time on screens. Don't allow screens in your child's bedroom as it affects sleep and it can't be monitored. So using handheld devices at night can interfere with sleep and children can find it a challenge to reduce their screen time if it's readily available. It can also be challenging to monitor a child's screen use if it's allowed in the bedroom. Model healthy electronic use. So monitor your own use of electronics and model good behaviour. It can be useful to model healthy electronic use for children as children do learn from what they see. Some habits that can be reduced include keeping the TV on for background noise or scrolling through your phone very regularly. Let's say if you're sitting on the couch in the evening, you might scroll through your phone and not even realise that you're doing it. So just monitoring your own behaviour. You can also consider parental controls. And again, this would depend on the age of your children. It's more suitable for younger children. So most smartphones have inbuilt tools designed to monitor the use of electronics. Some phones offer a number of restrictions, so you can lock the search engine and disable downloads. The next topic we're going to take a look at is how to support a child with anxiety. And we do have a one hour parent information talk dedicated to supporting children and teens with anxiety. So we're just going to touch on the highlights of that talk in this section. So firstly, we need to know what is anxiety. So we tend to understand anxiety as involving a combination of physical sensations in our body. So, for example, the butterflies in the stomach, worry thoughts in our head. So what if I don't make it to my interview on time? and specific behaviours. So for example, nail biting, checking the interview time, leaving extra early. In anxiety, these anxious bodily feelings, worry thoughts and behaviours all impact upon each other and can lead to a cycle of anxiety. So in simpler terms, it's just showing the relationship here between feelings, thoughts and behaviours, and they're all involved in anxiety. So it's important to note there is no such thing as an unusual or abnormal fear. All fears are normal, but some are simply more intense, more extensive and or more intrusive than others. So all fears are valid and that's really important to remember. So anxiety becomes a problem when it impacts on day to day activities, for example, going to school, when it causes ongoing and intense distress and upset, when it impacts on existing friendships, when it comes and goes for no apparent reason or when your child starts to avoid new experiences. So we all know that ongoing and excessive fear can begin to cause considerable distress or interference in everyday life and it can cause problems for the whole family. If a child is refusing to go to school, it's going to cause stress for everyone in the house. And it also can prevent children from engaging in age appropriate activities, which leads to missed opportunities to make friends and therefore can increase anxiety. So we're going to look at some strategies on how we can tackle anxiety now. So first and foremost, it's important to talk about it. It's important to talk to your child about their anxiety or their worries and acknowledge and validate how your child is feeling. Show them you, that you understand how they feel as everyone experiences anxiety. Genuine empathy will increase the chances that your child will accept your guidance and be motivated to work on reducing anxiety. And also providing accurate information about anxiety can reduce the confusion or shame and explaining that it's common and normal to experience anxiety. And when you ask about and acknowledge their feelings, you're sending them an important message that their feelings are valued and important. And recognising and naming these feelings is the first step towards learning to manage them in healthy, acceptable ways over time. 
But it is important to note there that validation doesn't always mean agreement. So if your child is terrified of going to the doctor because she has to get an injection, you don't want to belittle her fears, but you also don't want to amplify them. You want to listen and you want to be empathetic and help her understand what she's anxious about. The message you're looking to send is, I know that you're scared and that's okay and I'm here and I'm going to help you get through this. And it's particularly important relating to COVID-19, talking about any worries and correcting any misinformation that your child may have received. So I mentioned it briefly there normalizing anxiety is very very important so explaining to your children that anxiety is normal we can't stress this enough everybody experiences anxiety from time to time and although anxiety feels uncomfortable it's temporary and it will eventually decrease so like a wave it it builds up and then it ebbs away and it will pass another message that's important to get across is anxiety is not dangerous The sensations we experience in an anxious situation are normal and unpleasant, but they're not going to hurt us. And anxiety is adaptive, so we need some anxiety, and in fact, anxiety can help us. It alerts us to threats, protects us from danger, and it can help us perform at our best and motivate us to study for that exam or train for the big game. So if we didn't feel some level of anxiety, we would never achieve anything. So we need that little bit of anxiety, or we wouldn't bother studying for the test, or we wouldn't bother training for the big match that's coming up. And you can also model this in an age appropriate way. So share with your child when you're feeling anxious. So, for example, saying things like I have a big meeting at work tomorrow and I'm feeling quite nervous about it. I can feel the butterflies in my stomach, but it's okay. I know that it's normal to feel feel anxious about something like that. Relaxation techniques are great to use with children experiencing anxiety. So there are many different techniques out there, deep breathing, muscular relaxation, relaxing imagery, meditation and mindfulness. And it's becoming more common in schools now. So your child might have a particular relaxation technique that they already like. And whatever technique you choose, it's going to be very important to introduce and regularly practice relaxation exercises with your child when they are calm. So the aim of this is that they'll become very familiar with the exercises and will be able to use them when they're very stressed or anxious. These exercises often sound easy, but they're not. And they do take a little bit of practice. So a very, very quick and portable technique is deep breathing. So simply breathing in for four seconds. And then out for five seconds. Breathing in for four seconds. And breathing out for five seconds and doing that a number of times that really relaxes the body and it's important to calm the body before we can focus on the thoughts and behavior involved in anxiety routines are very comforting for children and teenagers as well so they're they're useful to calm an anxious child so children of all ages find routines reassuring so try to stick to regular daily routines where possible and we touched on this already when we spoke about sleep Routines increase predictability and help children to feel like they have more control because they know what's going to happen next. But be mindful that too rigid a routine can undermine a child's self-confidence. It's important to teach a child to be adaptable and cope with unexpected changes. So we, we know that people feel more stressed when things are chaotic and this goes for children too. And in fact, it's worse for kids who experience anxiety. So to keep your child as calm as possible, it will help to have a bit of daily routine that a child can get used to. So if your child is particularly anxious about COVID-19 or has health specific worries, it's important to explain to them that just because we're putting protective measures in place, that doesn't mean that, that something bad is going to happen. So the protective measures that we put in place, they do feel scary, particularly for children. And the more extreme the protections, the more children might feel as though they're evidence that trouble is coming. So explain that these are things that we do just in case and it's not confirmation that we're in trouble. So even saying something like, you see, it's like seatbelts. We don't wear seatbelts because we accept, expect something terrible to happen, but to keep us safe is, if something should happen. We're really lucky to have things that help keep us safe. Parents often worry that talking to their children about scary issues may increase the child's worry and anxiety. However, it often does the opposite. So we often use this phrase, name it to tame it. So once worries are identified and discussed or named 
and a concrete coping plan is devised, worries tend to decrease or be tamed. So it's okay to talk to your child about the virus. Knowledge is a powerful tool and it gives children some predictability in knowing what lies ahead, which can calm worry. So reiterating to our children that if you follow the guidelines, they will be safe. So appropriate hand washing, social distancing, etc. That's that's all there to keep us safe. How can I help to reduce my child's worry about the virus? Firstly, use age appropriate language and coping focused language. So we're doing everything we can to stay safe from the virus. Avoid voicing your emotional concerns in front of your children and monitor your own stress and anxiety levels. Monitor the amount of news and media your child is hearing about the virus. And I mentioned this earlier about children picking up on misinformation. Talk about what your family are doing to stay healthy. So tell your children, you know, we're we're washing our hands more often. We're socially distancing. We're avoiding large groups. We're doing everything we can to stay healthy. And sticking to your daily routines as much as usual is really useful for a child. So the next topic we're going to look at is emotional regulation or supporting your child in regulating their emotions. And we do have a full one hour parent information talk on this topic and we're going to touch on the highlights now. So what is emotional regulation? Emotional regulation is the ability to control our responses to arousing situations. It's the ability to manage our emotions and behaviour in accordance with the demands of the situation. It's a developmental achievement. We're not born with it. So that's really important to note there. We're not born with it. It's a set of skills that we learn, just like how we learn to walk, talk and eat. So emotional regulation includes the ability to resist highly emotional reactions to upsetting situations and the ability to calm yourself down when you do get upset. And what does emotional regulation look like then? Some highlights here. So a young baby with a wet nappy expresses her discomfort by crying. So that's how they emotionally regulate. A frustrated toddler has a temper tantrum. A school aged child may get upset but not have a tantrum as they're developing the skills to manage their own feelings and behaviour. And you may notice yourself that a teenager sometimes can go back to square one. So as a baby, the only way we know how to regulate is to cry and have highly emotional responses. But then as we, we grow up slightly, so toddlers have developing language skills, they can gradually learn to put words on their emotions. And then when we're school aged children, there's a greater responsibility for your own emotional regulation. So the ability to separate the internal feelings from your external expression, more control over their emotions. And then the teenager may regress to the preschool years. And there's a good reason for this, the brain. And we'll touch on that a little bit later on. So why is emotional regulation important? Supporting emotional regulation development in early childhood is an investment in later success because stronger emotional regulation predicts better performance in school, better relationships with others and fewer behaviour difficulties. Emotional regulation helps your child learn at school, behave in socially acceptable ways, make friendships, become more independent, manage stress and deal with difficult events or experiences so we all know that the research supports this but we all know that being able to control our emotions in different situations will make us better able to perform in school will be easier to get along with will be better behaved and it'll help us get a job then when we grow up as well so psychological research has shown that high levels of emotional arousal disrupts the capacity to think So the primitive brain takes over. And if you are interested in this topic, we talk about this at length in the anxiety talk. So it is important for us to be able to regulate ourselves to avoid letting the primitive brain take over whenever we feel strong emotions. So how has COVID-19 impacted on our children's emotional regulation? COVID-19 has meant many changes in young people's lives and some may be finding it difficult to cope. So there may be an emotional impact or worry about the virus. They've had less contact with peers. They may have been unable to pursue usual hobbies and interests as many sports and different things were cancelled. They've had to spend a lot more time around family, which isn't always easy. They've had less resources to manage emotions. And perhaps parents themselves are struggling to manage their own emotions. And that's all completely understandable. So now we're going to look at some strategies for supporting our children with emotional regulation. 
The first strategy we're going to look at is co-regulation and this is the supportive process between caring adults and children that fosters emotional regulation and you can see there from the diagram how do we do this? We do this by providing a warm responsive relationship, structuring our child's environment and teaching self-regulation skills. So co-regulation is basically when parents or caregivers help their child with their own emotional regulation. So then provide a warm, responsive relationship where children feel respected as individuals, comforted and supported in times of stress and confident that they will be cared for no matter what. This positive relationship will promote self-efficacy and allow children to feel secure enough to practice new skills and learn from their mistakes. Acceptance is another key to emotional regulation. So accept your child's emotion and responses and remember that it's not a deliberate attempt to make your life difficult. It's normal for a child to sulk or shout or withdraw at times. The important thing is to tune in and understand your child's emotional state, which will help your child cope and tolerate increasing amounts of emotional tension. So provide encouragement, be positive and always praise. So there's a well-established link between parenting and the development of emotional regulation in childhood. So there's been a number of studies on this and the main the main contributing factors to a child's developing emotional regulation is parental warmth, parental responsiveness and parental sensitivity. And acceptance is key to providing the warm, responsive relationship that we're talking about. If you are interested in the concept of tuning in or attunement as we call it we talk a lot about that in the parent information talk on attachment which will be uploaded to the youtube channel also so creating an environment that is physically and emotionally safe for children to explore and learn at their level of development without serious risk to their well-being Consistent, predictable routines and expectations likewise promote a sense of security by providing clear goals for behaviour. Consistent limits are important as well, so let your children know what's okay and what's not okay in your house. And clear household rules and predictable routines, so meal times to be at similar times every day and a bedtime routine. And we've touched on the importance of routine a lot during this talk. Expectations, clear expectations for your children helps them with their emotional regulation. So it, it, it lets them know this is how I expect you to behave in my house. And again, it goes back to the idea that routine and predictability are really comforting for children. So this just ensures that your child's environment is structured and predictable, which will encourage a feeling of calmness. And when we talk about being reliable and being consistent, we basically mean reliability is when you do what you say and consistency is when you s respond the same way you have in the past. And the, being reliable and consistent, we're talking about 80% of the time. We all know that life gets in the way. We can't stick to our rules and routines rigidly. But if you can stick in, to your routines and be reliable and consistent 80% of the time, that is good enough. The next topic we're going to look at is supporting children and teens in their return to school. And also we're going to look at school worries. So school worries in the context of COVID-19. So we all know students have enjoyed the benefits of spending time at home as they have been at home for a considerable amount of time now. They may be worried about catching the virus and passing it on to loved ones when they go back to school. They may be worried about any changes since they were last in school. They may find it difficult to return to routine. They may be worried about returning to difficulties that existed in school before. So perhaps they were having problems with their friends or they didn't get on with a certain teacher and they may, may be worried about returning to that. They may have developed bad habits by being off school for long periods. So perhaps their sleeping pattern is off. They're using their screens more often and things like that. And hopefully we will have already touched on some strategies to tackle some of those problems around sleeping and screen time and, anxi and anxiety as well. So there will be some children that perhaps w won't want to return to school. So what is school refusal? School refusal refers to a student's refusal to attend school or difficulty remaining in classes for an entire day. It can be a pervasive problem and can exert a heavy toll on students, families and the school. It can occur at any age, but it's most common in children and teens in the 5 to 7 and 11 to 14 age groups. The young person refuses to attend school and experiences significant distress about the idea of attending school. 
and it differs from truancy in that the young person is staying at home with the knowledge of the family and despite their efforts to enforce attendance. And what are some of the reasons it occurs? So there may be social and peer related difficulties. They may have learning and curriculum difficulties. They may have problems with the physical environment of the school. They may be worried about parental illness, separation in, in the family, a traumatic event may have happened. They may have difficulty with transitions. They may feel anxious going back to social situations or being separated from their caregivers. And they may be experiencing rewards inherent in staying at home. So perhaps they feel like they are being rewarded when they stay at home. So they might get more time with their parents. They may be allowed to play on the screens. They may be allowed to sleep in the day. These are some of the reasons that children don't want to go back to school or may refuse to go back to school. So what is the impact of school refusal on children and families? If any of you are experiencing this, you'll know that it does cause significant stress and anxiety for the young person. They are missing out on school and they're falling behind their peers. They, there may be regular conflict within the family over this issue. They may be difficult to supervise when they're at home all the time, particularly if parents are out working. They're missing out on opportunities to integrate socially and parents may feel a sense of failure. So there is a significant impact of school refusal on both the child and the families involved. So what can we do if our child is saying they don't want to go back to school? It's important firstly to use a warm and empathetic approach and speak calmly to the young person and let them know you understand. Encourage talking about how they feel using open questions. So try to use questions like what or why that elicits more of a response from them that they can't just answer yes or no. Yes or no questions don't encourage a conversation. You can encourage positive statements. So I can do this. I know that you can do this. Remember that time you didn't want to go to football practice, but you went anyway and you had a really good time and you felt great after it because you went. Praise every good day or interaction with school. That's very important as it will build their confidence. Try to ease transitions if they're finding that difficult and you can speak to school about making accommodations if that's an issue for your child. You can use breathing and mindfulness techniques and encourage them to use these techniques when they're at school if they need to. You could model positive coping and being brave. So the message you want to give is, I know you're having a difficult time and I will help you through this and I know that you can do it. So when a child doesn't want to go to school, it's important to be consistent and firm when required. Reduce the amount of reassurance you're giving your child. Encourage relationships and communication outside of school. So encourage your child or your teenager to communicate with their classmates and their friends outside of school as well. Be consistent, present as a united front and follow through on what you say. Make home life boring during school time. So if your child is refusing to go to school, make sure that he's not getting screen time. He, he's not allowed snacks or TV. He's not allowed to stay in bed for the day. So the idea is to make staying at home as boring as possible. Establish and maintain good routines. And we focused a lot on that throughout this talk. And also allow elements of control where possible. So when you are trying to encourage your child to go to school and they don't want to go, you can give them an element of control. So do you want to wear these shoes today or do you want to wear those shoes? What would you like to, br to bring for your lunch today? Just giving them little elements of control where possible. And you can make a plan with your child for each day of the week to encourage them to attend school. And if this is a problem that you're experiencing with one of your children, it is important to seek further support and advice. So if the problem persists, you can seek support from CAMS through your GP, NEPS, which is the Educational Psychology Service through school, or you can speak to the school principal and teachers. So collaboration between the child, the parents and the school is really, really important. So now we're going to look at peer relationships and helping your child maintain, re-establish and develop relationships after the long break from school. So first we're going to look at the importance of relationships. So as social beings, the capacity to form and maintain relationships is essential to us and how we function within society. It's a key component to being mentally healthy and having a positive sense of well-being. 
Strong relationships have a positive impact on our mental health and our brain development. It gives us the ability to succeed at school and in work. It helps us develop and maintain relationships into adulthood and it helps us to develop an appreciation for difference, which is important as we go through the teenage years and adulthood. So how has COVID-19 impacted on relationships or how might it have impacted on relationships? So COVID-19 has posed many challenges to the relationships children have with their family, peers, teachers and other significant people in their lives. Being around each other all the time, combined with worry over illness, children, money or sick relatives can increase stress levels and put a strain on relationships. So this is both true for children, teens and us as parents as well. There has likely been quite limited contact with others outside of the immediate family during the lockdown period and children may now worry about the physical contact with others because of what they've heard of the virus. Activities they may have enjoyed with their peers, their teachers and extended family were put on pause or altered which results in reduced connection. Children and teenagers may have gone through significant changes during this time, so growth spurts or puberty or transition. So perhaps your child was in secondary, was in primary school and he's now going into secondary school. So there have been significant changes in our children's lives during this time. Children may be particularly concerned or worried about older members of their family or family members who may be more vi- vulnerable to the virus. Children who may have been bullied at school or found the school environment difficulty may have been doing well when they were at home and may be reluctant to return to school. COVID-19 may have placed significant financial pressures on some families and one or both parents may have lost their job. One or both parents may now be working from home and that can also increase stress levels in the house. Children living in more rural or isolated areas may have had very little opportunity to engage or interact with other children without the structured activities involved in school and this can impact on their confidence as well. And children may have missed out on important transitions in social events, so graduations, communions, confirmations and birthdays and that can all impact on a child's self-efficacy and their confidence. So talk to your child about their emotions, feelings and worries. And remember, children may be hearing and seeing a lot about COVID-19 from a variety of sources. It's important that they know that they can talk to you over any fears they may have. It's also okay not to have all the answers to give them. You can tell them, I don't know right now, but I'm going to find that out for you and I'll, I'll let you know once I learn it. Mindfulness, relaxation and breathing exercises can help reduce anxiety. Acknowledge your child's fears, but also encourage a positive outlook. And facilitate alternative ways to connect with friends, even when they're back at school. Even f- You can facilitate Zoom calls or video games or socially distanced visits, text messages, things like that to keep your children connected. If your child is struggling to reconnect with friends or if they're worried about their peer relationships as they're going back to school, the idea is to listen and problem solve together. So when your child expresses that they are struggling, start by listening carefully to their concern. You can put your devices away and give them your undivided attention while you're having this conversation. Then try validating your child's emotion by making a caring statement. So saying things like, I can understand why you feel worried. So reflecting back to your child what they're telling you. And then together, you can identify a few possible solutions and help your child identify which solution seems best. You can then discuss different options or you can even role play the solutions to help your child build their confidence. Then the idea is that you'll encourage your child to try out the solution in real life when they're back at school and then you can come back together and discuss whether it worked or not. After that then it's useful to focus on things that are going well so you can do this by asking your child questions like what was the best thing that happened today? It's also important to manage your own level of stress. We all know that we can't pour from an empty glass and if we're stressed we may become more irritable and that can impact on our relationships with others also. So how can we manage our own levels of stress? Reduce expectations is a big one. So we need to know that good enough parenting is good enough. We can't be 100% right at all times. So we're looking just to be good enough. Try and find some quiet time for yourself each day, even if it is just for a few minutes. 
being physically active is also important and that's important for your physical and your mental health and it will also improve your quality of sleep. Make sure that you get good quality sleep. Being tired can make you very irritable and hopefully during the sleep shit section of this talk you would have picked up on some tips on getting a better quality night's sleep. Be aware of your alcohol intake and how it might be affecting you. Stay connected to other family and friends via phone or video calls or socially distanced visits. If you're feeling anxious or stressed over financial issues related to COVID-19, there are supports available to help you. And I'll include a reference to a support in the reference section at the end of this talk. So that's coming to the end of the talk. Now we're going to take a quick look at the main take home messages that we covered today. So sleep is as important as nutrition and exercise. Routine, routine, routine in, a, in every aspect of a child's life is very, very helpful. Encourage appropriate screen use. Anxiety is normal and part of everyday life. Talk about it. Provide a warm, responsive relationship to encourage emotional regulation and peer relationships. And seek further support if your child refuses to go back to school. And really important there, it is to look after yourself as well. So here are some references and additional reading if you're interested. And as I mentioned, we will be uploading a series of parent information talks which will cover these topics in, in more depth. So thank you all for listening today. Please share this with your friends and families if you found it useful. Thank you.